Well, good evening, friends. It's good to be gathered together at the close of the day to worship and to magnify the name of our God together. Let's hear our call to worship. We read these words to all who are weary and need rest. There's something wrong with that speaker, isn't it? It's crackling. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, and to all who sin and need a savior. This church opens wide her doors in the name of Jesus, the friend of sinners. Let's magnify and bless his name together in the words of Psalm 122, Psalm 122, and singing the whole psalm. I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me, Jerusalem within thy gates, our feet shall stand and be. Jerusalem as a city is compactly built together, and to that place the tribes go up, the tribes of God go thither. Psalm 122, and singing the whole psalm. If you're able to stand for this singing, please do so, and we'll remain standing afterward as we call on the Lord in prayer. Psalm 122. I joyed when to the house of God go up this of God go thither to Israel's testimony there to God's name thanks to me thrones of judgment in the David's house there stay in the Jerusalem may have O 
Lord in heaven, as we come into your presence this evening, we praise and we bless you for this opportunity that we have to magnify your name together and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that we have in being able to gather with your people to celebrate the wonder and the glory of who you are and the magnitude and the all-sufficiency of your grace. We thank you and bless you for the words of this psalm, where the psalmist was full of such an excitement and such enthusiasm about the prospect of being able to meet with your people and engage in the worship of your name with your people, the group of people known as Jerusalem, a city built together. And we thank you and bless you that as we read your word, we are reminded that your people, the church, are described as being New Jerusalem, all that Jerusalem was meant to be, all that it typified and all that it foreshadowed. And we thank you and bless you that we can also enjoy this time of worshiping your name, just as saints of old did in days gone by. We thank you for this day. We thank you that you are the God who is so kind, so gracious, that you recognize the need for us to cultivate the holy habits of taking a step back from the busyness, the stresses, the anxieties going on in the world around us, you give us those moments to be still, to recognize who you are and what you have done and are doing and have promised to do in your word. We thank you and bless you that you have given us an opportunity tonight to remember that you are the God of creation, the God of redemption, that you are the God who creates and you are the God who saves. But not only are you the one who creates and the one who saves, you are also the God of providence. You are the one who is working at all times in ways at times that we can see ways that we may be able to understand something of, but you are also the God who is constantly working in countless unseen ways, ways that we are unaware of, and ways that we may not know the purpose of this side of eternity. We praise and we bless you that you are the one who is upholding all things by the word of his power, and we praise and bless you that you give us this unique moment to meet with you and to call you collectively and corporately our Father in heaven. We pray, O oh Lord, for each and every person gathered in this building tonight. You know each and every one. You know the joys. You know the sorrows. You know the happiness and you know the heartache. You know that some may have come into this place full of gladness and with a great longing and desire to be in this place. And maybe others came here tonight feeling wearied, feeling worn out, feeling burdened with many cares and many anxieties. But we thank you that all are here. And we pray that you would enable us, from the youngest to the oldest tonight, to worship you in spirit and in truth. That you would enable us to put aside all other distractions, all our other disturbances and discouragements. And that we might center our gaze on the one who is altogether lovely, the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember those who cannot be here tonight. Again, we remember those who are still suffering from COVID, asking that you might enable them to make a full recovery. And that they would once again be found worshiping you with your people. We're aware of others in the congregation who are unwell, those who maybe have had providences even in the past week that have prevented them from being here tonight. Watch over them, we pray, and may they know your blessing, may they know your nearness to them. And again, we remember those who may have made a conscious decision not to be here for whatever reason. Maybe some who have no more interest in gathering with your people, and we pray that you would once again rekindle that interest, once again rekindle that desire. But we also remember those who are not here because they feel that they are in a backslidden state. They feel so unworthy. They feel like hypocrites for gathering with your people. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you might once again assure them with the promises of your gospel, all the grace that is provided in that gospel, and that they would once again be found magnifying your name with your people. So bless us, we pray. Forgive all our sin and go with us for Christ's sake into this service as we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, it's, it's uh, good to see the younger ones uh, here this evening. And uh, I like to think of myself as a, as a bit of a chef. Uh, I, I like to try cooking new things. Uh, certainly, I see myself as more than a chef than, than Natalie. I can say that because uh, she's not here tonight, so uh, I can get away with whatever I want. And I hope that nothing gets back to her. Uh, but I love uh, I love cooking. I love trying new things. Uh, and a few years ago, I bought some uh, chili flakes. And uh, these chili flakes were meant to give uh, 
uh, a kind of different flavors to the foods that I was cooking. And so I thought I would try after a few weeks adding these chili flakes uh, to some of the things that I was making. Uh, I added them to a bolognese and it tasted awful. And then I tried adding them to a curry and it tasted dreadful. Anything I seemed to add these chili flakes to, it seemed to uh, spoil uh, whatever I was cooking. It wasn't anything to do with my cooking. It was uh, all to do with these chili flakes. And it was amazing because they were just tiny wee things. Uh, you know, you could have loads in your hand and you wouldn't be any the wiser off it. These tiny wee chili flakes making such a difference in the food and spoiling the food in such a big way. And, you know, as I was thinking about that this evening, I was thinking about how it doesn't take very much to spoil our relationship with Jesus. It doesn't take very much to spoil our relationship with God. Sometimes a very, very small thing that we let into our lives can spoil the relationship that we have with Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the book of Nehemiah this evening. We've been looking at Nehemiah, I think, since uh, February. And uh, maybe you younger ones will be quite glad that we're coming out of Nehemiah tonight. I'm not sure. But uh, in Nehemiah, at the very end, we see that the people were allowing small things into their lives that became much bigger things and were spoiling and destroying their relationship with God. And this evening, I simply want to encourage you younger ones, as I'll be encouraging all of us, to, to just be looking at your own life and thinking, is there anything in my life that is spoiling my relationship with Jesus. It might be a very, very small thing, as, as small as a wee chili flake, but it can make a huge difference. So that's what we're going to be thinking about as we look at Nehemiah now, just how small things can disrupt our relationship with Jesus. So if you uh, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 13, do you know, Spang, if there's a way of turning off whichever speaker it is that's rattling away, yeah, I'll carry on reading and maybe uh, Spang, you'll be able to find out which of these speakers it is. And hopefully it's not all of them. So Nehemiah chapter 13, and we're going to read from verse 4 uh, to the end of the chapter. Nehemiah 13 from verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber, where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes of Babylon, I went to the king, and after some time I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers. And I brought back the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padiah of the Levites, and as their assistant Hanan, the son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O my God, concerning this. And do not wipe out my good deeds, which I have done for the house of my God and for his service. In those days, I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of food, goods, and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. And then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem, before the Sabbath, I commanded that the door should be shut, 
and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will hands on you. And from that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I made them swear in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sambal at the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And thus I cleansed from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his own work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O my God, for good. Amen. This is the word of God to us this evening. Thanks for that, Spangy. I think that's a relief for those sitting in that corner where that wee rattling sound was going on. So it's good to have a technical whiz kid uh, in the congregation. Let's again sing to the Lord's praise this time in the words of the hymn, Rock of Ages. And if you're able to stand for this singing, uh, please do so, which is our confidence as we worship the Lord this evening. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin, the double cure, save me from its guilt and power. If you're able to stand for this singing, please do so. Play for me. in thee. Let the water and the blood i 
to worlds alone. And behold, the on the throne, rock of ages, clear for me. Well, as we prepare our minds and hearts to feed on the word of God together, let's come before him in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you and we bless you for these words that we have just sung. Words that remind us that our standing with you, our forgiveness, isn't based on anything that we have done. It's not based on our feelings. It's not based on our emotions. It's not based on the tears that we might cry or how sorry we might feel for the things that we have said and thought and done. It's all found in Christ. And we pray that this evening you would assure each and every one of us afresh of that finished work of our Lord and Savior, that we would be able to rest in the one who is the rock of ages, because there is no safer and no more secure a place to be than to be in him. We thank you and we bless you for this time that we have now to focus on your word together. And we thank you that you are a God who speaks. From the very first pages in the book of Genesis, we are confronted with the fact that you are the speaking God, the God of communication, the God of revelation, that you are the one who speaks a creation into existence and it points to something of your glory and something of your majesty. But you are also the God who speaks into the pages of this written book, the Bible. You are the one whose spirit was upon men and women of old as they wrote these words that we find and that we study. We are aware, O Lord, that this is not a dead historical document, but this is the living and inspired word of the living God. The God, the word that you have spoken into but also the word that you continue to speak out of. We pray now that your spirit would move among each and every one of us, from the youngest to the very oldest, that we would hear you speaking to us and addressing us in the situations that we might be finding ourselves, maybe the situations that we might be facing in days ahead. We pray, O oh Lord, that this word would be a reality to each and every one of us, a living and an active word, a word that would pierce beyond the mind to the very heart, the very soul, and that you would use this word to conform each and every one of us more and more to the likeness and the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please open our eyes that they might see more of your beauty and more of your glory. Please open our ears that they would hear you addressing us through your word, that we would hear your indicatives of what you have done that we might hear your imperatives of what you require, and that we might hear your invitations to come and receive grace in the gospel. We pray that you might open our minds, that can so often be dull to the things of the gospel, that they might be discerning, that they might be open, that they might be receptive, that they might be given understanding. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you might open our hearts, that you might... Break down hearts that can be like stone and replace them with hearts of flesh that are moved when they consider the things of Jesus. And through this, we pray that our lips might be opened, that we might praise and magnify your name as individuals and as a congregation. So hear us and forgive us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, would you turn with me, please, to the words that we read in Nehemiah chapter 13, in Nehemiah chapter 13, and reading again verses 4 down to 9. Nehemiah 13 from verse 4. Now, before this, Elisha, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, 
which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. And while this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes of Babylon, I went to the king, and after some time I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem, and I then discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I wonder, friends, have you ever read a book or maybe watched a film? And as you came to the end of that book, as you came to the end of that film, you found yourself thinking, is that it? Is that it? One of my favorite books of all time, you probably know this, is uh, C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle where C.S. Lewis closes the book and his chronicles of Narnia with these words. Then things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world, all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and ever, and in which, and I love this one, in which every chapter is better than the one before. That's a proper ending. The ending of Nehemiah leaves us slightly disappointed. It's a bit of an anticlimax. In these verses, we find Nehemiah dealing with problems that emerged during his absence from the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. And so this evening, as we come to the end of our studies in Nehemiah, we're going to focus first on the problems that Nehemiah faced and then on two practical applications from the text. First, we have the problems that Nehemiah has to address. First, we have the problems concerning the temple. You see that in verses 4 to 14. And Nehemiah begins by noting the first problem that he had to deal with in relation to the temple in verses 4 to 9. And he starts by highlighting the compromise in verses 4 to 6. And back in verses 1 to 3 that we looked at last week, the people had agreed to separate themselves from the foreigners who were living among them, all those of foreign descent, all those who didn't worship the Lord and belong to him. And now we're told what had happened. Elisha the priest is described here as being close or related to Tobiah the Ammonite. And he prepares a large chamber in the temple for Tobiah to live in. This chamber had once housed the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, the tithes of grain, wine, and oil. And it's now accommodating Tobiah. And we're also told when it happened. Have you ever heard the phrase, when the cat's away, the mice will play? Well, we're told here that Nehemiah had left Jerusalem, returned to Persia in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, that's 433 BC. And while Nehemiah is away, Elisha compromises and he welcomes in Tobiah. And Nehemiah goes on to highlight the confrontation in verses 6 to 9. After asking leave from the Persian king, he returns to Judah and discovers the evil that Elisha had done. It's evil because this was a sacred space that uh, the priests and the Levites alone were to work and walk in. And it's evil because this man, Tobiah especially, had been consistent in his opposition to the Lord and his people as the walls of Jerusalem were being built. And having made this discovery, Nehemiah takes decisive action. He's angry. He's angry at this evil, and he throws out Tobiah's household furniture. He gives orders that the chamber be cleansed, deep cleaned, fumigated, and he orders that the chamber be filled once again with the vessels of the house of God, with the grain offering, and with the frankincense. But there is a second problem relating to the temple that Nehemiah has to deal with in verses 10 to 13. Once again, Nehemiah highlights a compromise. Verse 10. If you remember back in chapter 10, the people had promised to make provision for the priests, make provision for the Levites, 
and they had promised that in doing this, they would not neglect the house of their God. But upon returning to Judah, look what Nehemiah sees. The people haven't been making provision for the priests and Levites. And it's left the priests and Levites having to leave the house of God, having to leave the temple, and they're going off and working in the fields to find some food. And having highlighted this compromise, Nehemiah highlights the confrontation. Verses 11 to 13, we're told what he said. He starts at the top. He addresses the officials. And he challenges them by asking them, why are you forsaking? Why are you neglecting the house of God? Goes further though. Look at what he did. He gathers the Levites and he sets them in their stations. He then appoints Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, Padiah the Levite, and Hanan to assist them. These men are marked out, you see, as being reliable, and they're given the responsibility of overseeing the distribution of food and other provisions for the Levites. And once he has dealt with these problems, Nehemiah goes to the Lord in prayer. Look at verse 14. Throughout this book, we have seen that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Again and again, we find him going to the Lord in prayer. And on this occasion, he prays that his God would remember him and would not wipe out, would not blot out, would not forget the good deeds that he had done for his house. Then second, we have the problems concerning the Sabbath. Look at verses 15 to 22. Again, Nehemiah starts by focusing on a compromise, verses 15 and 16. Back in chapter 10, the people had promised that they would observe, they would keep the Sabbath. They recognized that that was a day that marked them out as the Lord's people. They recognized that this was a day that marked them out as those who were trusting in the Lord to provide. They didn't need to work. They didn't need to go shopping. They didn't need to go traveling. They didn't need to do any of that on the Sabbath because the Lord would provide. But now Nehemiah sees that the Sabbath and its observance is being neglected. Verses 15 and 16. He knows that he saw people engaging in work on the Sabbath. Some were trading on wine presses. Others were bringing in heaps of grain, loading them on donkeys, as well as wine, figs, and all kinds of loads. And he also notes that he saw people not simply working, but also engaging in commerce on the Sabbath. Tyrians were bringing in fish and all kinds of goods. And as they bring in their produce, they start selling it to the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, and they're doing this in the holy city. Having highlighted the compromise, Nehemiah draws their attention once again to the confrontation. Look at verses 17 to 22. He begins with a word of rebuke, verses 17 and 18. Once again, he confronts those at the top, confronts the nobles, And he accuses them of doing an evil thing by profaning the Sabbath. He goes on and he reminds them that their fathers had acted in this way and that God had responded by bringing disaster, destruction on them and their city. He had He had brought the Babylonians to attack their city, assault their city, carry them off into exile in Babylon. It was a judgment of God. It was an act of God. It wasn't just about politics. It was about the sovereignty of God. And he concludes by telling him that they are now in danger of bringing more wrath, more judgment from the Lord on themselves by profaning the Sabbath. And having rebuked the people, Nehemiah brings a resolution to them. Look at verses 19 and 22. Some people can be very good at identifying problems. They're no good at bringing out solutions. But they're great at bringing out problems, saying what's wrong with something. But Nehemiah is different. Nehemiah takes a number of practical steps to ensure the ongoing preservation, the ongoing sanctity of the Sabbath. Look at what he does. He orders that the gates of Jerusalem be shut from sunset the day before the Sabbath to sunset on the day of the Sabbath. He then stations some of his servants at the gates to ensure that no loads are brought into the city. He then warns the merchants who are lingering outside the gates to leave or he'll lay hands on them. And I don't think when he says that he'll lay hands on them, it's like what ministers do when they appoint an elder or a minister to office and they lay hands on them. This is laying hands on them to give them a real doing. He's going to deal with them decisively. And then he instructs the Levites to purify themselves and come and guard the gates to preserve the holiness of the Sabbath. And once again, having dealt with the problem, 
we find Nehemiah going to the Lord in prayer. Look at verse 22. He asks his God to remember him for this. And he asks his God to spare him according to the greatness of his steadfast love, the greatness of his covenant love. Nehemiah is thinking to himself, we are in deadly danger. We are in deadly danger because we have been profaning the Sabbath. The Lord could once again destroy us. And so he's saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have compassion on me. Lord, spare me according to your covenant love. Third, we have the problems concerning intermarriage, verses 23 to 29. Nehemiah starts by focusing on intermarriages among the people in general in verses 23 to 27. Once again, he draws their attention to the compromise in verses 23 and 24. If you remember back in chapter 10, the people had promised that they would not give their daughters to the foreigners, the unbelievers living in the land, and they had also promised that they would not take the daughters of foreigners and give them to their sons. But Nehemiah discovers here that the Jewish men had married women of Ashdod, women of Ammon, and women of Moab. And what's even worse, did you catch it? What's even worse is that half of the children born to such couples cannot speak the language of the people of Judah. Now, friends, that is a very serious issue. The language of the people of Judah was Hebrew. This was the language that the scriptures were written in and read in. This was the language that the Psalms were written in and sung from. And if there are children who aren't speaking Hebrew, it indicates that they have parents who aren't reading the scriptures to them aren't singing the psalms to them. And even worse, even worse, it means that they have parents who are not taking them to the temple, the place of corporate worship. That's where these marriages to unbelievers have led. Children are being born and raised in homes where God's not been mentioned. God's word's not been read. And God's worship's not been engaged in. And having drawn our attention to the compromise, Nehemiah draws our attention to the confrontation. Verses 25 to 27, we can see what Nehemiah did. He confronts these men and he curses them. He beats some of them and he pulls out the hair of others. He's furious at what he's seen. He, he doesn't hold back. And we can also know what Nehemiah says. He makes the people take an oath to stop engaging in these marriages. He reminds them that there was no king like Solomon, a man loved by God, a man beloved by God, but unbelieving women had made this great king, this wise king, this much loved king sin. And he then tells them that what they're doing is a great evil and an act of treachery against their God. Nehemiah doesn't mince his words. He doesn't pretend that everything's okay. He doesn't say, well, we've all got different opinions on this subject. No, he, he is very clear. He is very direct. But there are also not simply intermarriages among the people in general, but among the priests in particular. Look at verse 28. Once again, Nehemiah draws their attention to the compromise. Beginning of verse 28, we have an unnamed son of Jehoiada, grandson of Elisha, the high priest, and this man has married a daughter of none other than Sanballat the Horonite. This is the man who stands in the priestly line. This is the man who could quite easily become high priest following his grandfather, Elisha. And this man has gone and married an unbeliever, and not any unbeliever, but rather the daughter of a man who is so viciously, violently, vehemently opposed to the Lord and his cause. And Nehemiah confronts him over this. Look at verse 28 again. It's interesting to know that Nehemiah doesn't say anything to him. It simply chases him away. He doesn't want this man near the Lord's temple, doesn't want this man near the Lord's people. If this man is going to be responsible for teaching the word of God to the people, Nehemiah says, not a chance, not a chance. And having dealt with the problem, Nehemiah prays in verse 29. And the prayer on this occasion is different to the prayers of verse 14 and verse 22. 
Nehemiah doesn't ask his God to remember him now. Instead, he asks his God to remember to take action against those who have desecrated the priesthood in this way. It's almost like one of these implicatory psalms where he's calling down the judgment of God on those priests like Jehoiada's son. Finally, we come to Nehemiah's epitaph, verses 30 and 31. You know, whenever people speak about Nehemiah, in fact, if I was to do a quiz with you before we began this series and was to ask, what's Nehemiah all about? We would probably say, well, it's all about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And in some ways, it is about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, but that only takes place in the opening six chapters. That's not Nehemiah's concern as he closes this chapter and this account of his life. Instead, he focuses on three things that he did for the Lord and his cause and his people. He he cleansed them from everything foreign or unbelieving. He established the duties of the priests and the Levites, and he made provision for all the different offerings, all the different sacrifices. And he prays to his God, and he asks that his God would remember him for good. And there's the end of Nehemiah. Now, friends, having observed the problems that Nehemiah has to address, we come to the practical applications from this text. As we consider these verses, we are being shown how quickly compromise can set in. How quickly compromise can set in. That's what we see in Nehemiah chapter 13. Instead of separating themselves from the unbelieving Ammonites, the people are welcoming un- the, uh, this Ammonite, Tobiah, into their temple. Instead of making provision for the Levites, the people are neglecting the house of their God and the Levites are having to go and work in the fields. Instead of upholding the sanctity of the Sabbath, the people are buying on it and selling on it. Instead of refusing to take unbelieving spouses, they're marrying them and raising unbelieving children. And it all takes place not long after the city has been rebuilt and the people have rededicated themselves to the Lord and to his word. And that is such an important lesson for us to consider this evening. It is amazing how quickly compromise can set in in the lives of the Lord's people. Amazing. And that can be seen in the history of the 19th century free church. If you remember, in 1843, the disruption took place where many ministers, many elders, many members, many adherents left the established church to form the Church of Scotland free. It was a movement that had a lot of promise, a movement that had a lot of potential under the leadership of evangelical men such as Thomas Chalmers. Colleges were built, churches were built, manses were built. In a very short space of time, there was great growth. There was great blessing. If you speak to some free church people, they say it was the golden age of the free church. And probably in many ways it was. But within 20 years, this denomination that had so much promise, so much potential, had begun to compromise. They had begun to allow their students to study under men who denied the Westminster Confession of Faith. And it resulted in a massive theological drift, a massive theological decline, a massive theological downgrade where false teaching was going into the colleges and from the colleges into the pulpits and from the pulpits into the pews. And so by 1890, the free church was radically different, almost unrecognizable from the free church of 1843. It doesn't take long for compromise to set in, in the life of a denomination, the life of a congregation, the life of a Christian. And it can happen almost overnight. It can happen almost immediately after a season of great spiritual blessing. No no sooner has Noah come out of the ark and been given the Lord's covenant promises, and he's found getting drunk in a vineyard that he's planted. No sooner has David received the Lord's promise that he will have an eternal dynasty, a lasting house, than he's found getting into bed with his friend's wife. And no sooner has Peter confessed Jesus to be the Christ and the Son of God, and Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, then he is rebuking Jesus for speaking about his looming death on the cross. And you know, friends, if these great men of faith could faint and fail and fall, if they could collapse, if they could compromise, if they could cave in so easily, you and I can do the same. And the high free can do the same. And the free church can do the same. 
We are all prone, as the hymn writer said, to wandering and leaving the God we love. And that is why it is important, that is why it is imperative that we pray and keep praying that the Lord would keep us because we cannot keep ourselves. I can't keep myself. And if I can't keep myself, I cannot keep the Kirk session or this congregation. We need to ask the Lord to keep us. But as we consider these verses, we're not simply being shown how quickly compromise can set in, but also how greatly Christ is needed. How greatly Christ is needed. That's what we see in Nehemiah 13. Dale Rolf Davis writes, the book of Nehemiah seems to peter out in what might be considered a somewhat unsatisfactory manner. Not so much with a bang as with a whimper. You see, here is Nehemiah, this, this great reformer who has led the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, led the revitalization of the people of Jerusalem. But when he returns to Jerusalem, he finds the spiritual condition of the city and its people in a worse state than it was in when he arrived 12 years previously. In fact, it's no better than it was in the years leading up to the exile in Babylon. The promises of this great restoration that the Lord's prophets had proclaimed and had spoken about are far from being realized. They're far from being fulfilled. And so we're left looking for and longing for a true and better Nehemiah. We're looking for and longing for one who will bring a true, lasting, perfect restoration of God's cause and God's people. And that is what the gospel presents us with. The gospel presents us with a Jesus who has come and is coming again to restore not some things, but all things. The gospel presents us with a Jesus who is building his church. Even tonight, he is building this church and his church. And he is building it in such a way that the gates of hell will not prevail, will not conquer it. The gospel presents us with a Jesus who is going to usher in a day when his people, his church, New Jerusalem, those whom he has purchased and purified with his own blood will be revealed with an unsurpassed, unrivaled, unmatched splendor. The book of Nehemiah, friends, doesn't end saying they all lived happily ever after, but the gospel tells us. The gospel tells us that Jesus and his restored people will live happily forever and ever in a new restored creation as a new and restored people. That is the gospel. And so this evening, I simply want to close by saying to each one of us, let's fix our eyes on this Jesus. This is an exhortation. This is an encouragement to us as a congregation. Friends, you've heard me say it week after week, and I'll say it for the last time, and you'll be hearing it in your sleep. But I promise this is the last time I'll say this until I do another series in Nehemiah. But as we go about regrouping, rebuilding, reaching out to our community with the gospel after two years of lockdown and restrictions, let's fix our eyes on this Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about the high free, not about our honor, not about our reputation, not about our glory. It's all about him. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus. If we are going to focus our eyes on what life was like two years ago, we are going to be depressed. And if we look, fix our eyes on what is maybe apparent in front of us, we are going to get depressed. So let's fix our eyes on this Jesus. And this is an exhortation and this is an encouragement to every individual Christian who is here tonight. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Not on who we are, not on what we have done, not on what we are doing, not on what we hope to do, but on Jesus. It's all about him. I am prone to wandering and leaving the one I love. You are prone to wandering and leaving the one we love. And maybe we came into this building tonight and we think to ourselves, yes, I have wandered over this past week and I have left the one that I love over this past week. I am in such a backslidden black place. But I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. 
And this is an exhortation and this is an encouragement to everyone who might be here tonight and isn't yet a Christian. My friend, will you fix your eyes on this Jesus? Don't fix your eyes on yourself. Don't fix your eyes on some other person. And please don't fix your eyes on a minister or on an elder because you will only end up disappointed. You will be massively disappointed if you fix your eyes on me. Fix your eyes, friend, on this Jesus. Fix your eyes on the one who is able to keep you from stumbling. Able to keep you from falling. Able to present you blameless before the glory of his Father with great joy. It's, it's all about Jesus. Not about what you can do for him, but about what he can do and has done for all his people, including you, if you will have him. Well, friends, the book of Nehemiah is about rebuilding. It's a book about revitalizing under this godly reformer. But it leaves us looking to our glorious redeemer and to his great work of restoration. The book of Nehemiah is more than a book on how to get a church back on track after lockdown. The book of Nehemiah is a book, friends, that drives us to the hope of the gospel, the Lord Jesus, the one who is going to restore and make all things new. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you now for all that we have been able to consider from the book of Nehemiah over these weeks and over these months. And we pray that all these studies that we have considered, and especially our study this evening, might be a blessing to each and every one of us, a blessing to our souls. And that this might have been a sermon and a series where our eyes might have been encouraged to look away from everything going on round about us and to lift our eyes up to Jesus and to fix our eyes on him and on him alone, the one who is the great redeemer and the one who has come to restore all things. Help us, O Lord, we pray, as we endeavor to regroup, as we endeavor to rebuild, as we endeavor to reach out to our community with the gospel after these two years of lockdowns and restrictions, years that have been difficult and painful for every single one of us, years where none of us have probably come away feeling the better for it. But we thank you that you are the God who is in control and you are working all things together for good, even these last two years. And we pray that we might see your gospel flourishing and growing and expanding through our congregation in the days, in the weeks, the months, and indeed the years that may lie ahead. Keep us, O Lord, united to each other. Keep us united to our, yourself. Please keep us, because we cannot keep ourselves. We're all prone to wandering. We're all prone to leaving the one we love. If we can see a denomination like the Free Church of the 19th century beginning to collapse and compromise after so much blessing, and the people of Jerusalem collapsing and compromising after seeing so much blessing in Nehemiah's time, how easy it is for us also to collapse and compromise as individuals or as a congregation. Please keep us and build us for your glory as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's conclude by singing to the Lord's praise the words of the hymn, There is a Redeemer. And if you're able to stand for this singing, please do so. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's only Son.
forgetting us your son, leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Son of God, Messiah, and for sinners May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be with each and every one of us now to the end of the age as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.